The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are my own or those of my guests and in no way represent the views of the company or companies that I or we work for. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they are told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Ident. You're listening to Squawk Ident an aviation podcast dedicated to the journey and the challenges surrounding the life and career of Aviator Tony and his guests. Together, we will explore the many pathways to an aviation profession, the realities of what a professional aviator can expect in today's marketplace, and we share many stories along the way. I'm your host, Aviator Tony, an airline pilot currently flying for a legacy airline with close to 20 years on the flight line. This is episode 30 of Squawk Ident, recorded on the 4th of March, 2020, from the Aviator Sound Studios somewhere in Southern California. On this episode of Squawk Ident, I'm joined by my co-host, Rob D. Together, we discuss some of the factors that continue to adversely affect the aviation profession and how they could potentially create a big problem for an aviator's journey in today's marketplace. First, we'll take a look at the 737 Maximus. We ask the question, will it return to the flight line as we have come to know it, or will it be rebranded? We then take a look at how the COVID-19 state of emergency might just be the next big economic disaster for the airline industry. And does art imitate life? We take a look at a few films and novels from the past that are eerily familiar to the headlines of today. All this and more on this episode of Squawk Ident. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show, right after a brief word from our sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Aviator Tony, and you're listening to Squawk Ident. Joining us today on this episode of Squawk Ident from his estate home in Flower Mound, Texas. He is a former international and professional racquetball champion, a member of the 9G Club, and an AMP and avionics tech. Currently, he is a 737 pilot for a U.S. legacy carrier we call Legacy Airlines. Please help me in welcoming to the show... Rob D. Rob, how the hell are you? Hey, I'm doing good, Tony. It's good to be back. How you been? Oh, doing great. Been very busy. We've had uh, a lot of wonderful shows with some wonderful guests that have uh, allowed uh, Squawk Ident crew and and myself to interview them. Uh, It's been a real treat. I've got to tell you, you know, listening to their stories and their journeys has been just eye-opening and inspirational. It has been. I really enjoyed uh, episode 27 with your uh, Army Colonel friend there, Terry. He's uh, he's one incredible man there. I mean, he's had a pretty incredible journey, and um, he's still, you know, slugging away at, at the Army and and uh, flying. Uh, I forget what he was flying, but man, what a good story he had. Oh yeah, yeah. Between the uh, the Blackhawks and the Apache and the uh, C12 and the, right. Oh man, he just has had. Uh, a journey that I've, since the day I met him, I've been really kind of looking up to him. And the great thing about it, he is a fellow Tailwind flight instructor. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty uh, pretty proud to learn about that, too. I was like, right on, man. We had some, had some really good guys come out of there. We, we really have, you know. And uh, hopefully someday in the near future, we might have some, uh, you know, Tailwind 2 maybe going up. But uh, I don't know if that's in the cards for the Guilfoys, but <laughs> but uh, that was a wonderful place to work. Uh, I think the leadership there really did set that place apart. 
And then episode 28 was another one. I mean, can you imagine yeah. uh, flying along, talking to this captain, and he's saying, oh, yeah, I used to work for British Aerospace, and uh, I was building the wing on the first yeah. prototype of the first Airbus 8320, and here I am, captain on one, flying it. And I was like, yeah. what? Yeah, what an amazing story. If, yeah. if uh, you're listening to this podcast and you haven't listened to the podcast number 28, you got to take a listen. This is an incredible story. And, Tony, you you – you hit the nail right on the head. That is amazing. Just having the opportunity to sit down and talk with him uh, is just priceless. You know, what I mean, yeah. Wow, what a what an incredible guy, an incredible story he has. How many airlines has he had oh to work God. for to get to where he's at now? You know, and that happily incredible. married all yeah. those years. His wife has has had the patience yeah. to support him. Just an amazing, amazing story. And I wish him all the best, uh, Captain Ash out there and you know just want to say thank you uh for all of his support and then episode 29 which was only a few days ago uh finally got to sit down with a dear friend who was one of the uh fellow new hire classmates that i had over at the sandpiper regional as we call it here on squawk ident and his journey went left when mine went right and you know for him to be at a legacy carrier we affectionately call acme and and for Acme. us to end yep. up here at uh, the Legacy Carrier, you know, um, it's just been a real treat to be able to sit down with these individuals and really get an idea of how different a journey can be. And it doesn't matter if you've been in the game a long time or a short time. It, it can be an amazing uh, story to tell. So I really yep, enjoyed it. I totally it. agree. Yeah. That was a good one. So, yep. But here we are. Episode 30, and I am very excited to be sharing this one with you, Rob. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about what's been going on in the news lately and how it just we're being bombarded by all this information. And, you know, not to say it's not serious, it's absolutely a serious uh, events that are happening around the world. Uh, my wife and daughter right now are at Costco doing their their weekly shop. And could you believe it? All the Costco's in Southern California right now are completely out of water and toilet paper. Really? I never <laughs> would have and thought. And does that have to do with anything that's going on in the world? <laughs> well, since you mentioned it, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Los Angeles and Southern California are now uh, deemed a little bit of a higher risk than previously reported uh, simply because of the number of patients that are now coming down with this uh, COVID-19, which is the latest uh, version of the coronavirus. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later in the show. But first, I'd like to just catch up a little bit with you since it's been a while since you've been on the show. What the heck have you been up to, Rob? Well, since the last time I was on the air, um, I was we talked about my uh, me preparate, preparing for training, and uh, so I went through three days of training. And um, got to tell you, those guys at the schoolhouse they do a great job. Um, I had we actually had I actually had two really good Czech airmen um, during my uh, my sim session. Uh, one was just supervising the other guy. I guess they were uh, doing some standards and stuff like that. Uh, and um, two excellent Czech airmen during a Czech ride. It was just awesome. We, me and the captain went through our training event and we just learned a whole bunch of stuff. And it wasn't like we were, you know, needed any kind of retraining or anything like that. But it's just, it's great when you can go in. And, you know, come prepared, you know, your stuff and, you know, you're, you're doing so well that the Czech airman has enough time to uh, show you some things that maybe you would never see in any other training event. That's kind of outside of this, the, the, um, the syllabus of training. Yeah. So it was really fun. It was really good stuff. Yeah, I bet. And I always enjoy those few extra minutes in the simulator where they're like, well, you know, okay, well. Let's take a look at this. Uh, have you ever seen this? Or, you know, this is what the yeah. focus is for next time. And, yep. you know, that's how you know you, you've done a good job and, and you came prepared. And we were talking about that back in episode 26, where, you know, it's better to be overprepared than 
and uh, underwhelmed exactly. than the other way around. And it seems to me that you followed that uh, very <laughs> much to the letter there, didn't you? I feel like I did. I mean, I, when I went into the sim, I, I still had a few butterflies as always, but quickly, you know, I soon relaxed and uh, just felt, you know, right at home, right where I needed to be and where I, right where I wanted to be. And I uh, just showed the Czech airman that I, that I knew what I was doing. And, um, you know, I studied and, uh, it was a good ride. I mean, there was really, you know, the, the debrief items were so minor that, you know, we were kind of chuckling at it as we went along. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it just, it just made for a good quality learning training event. Um, so then, um, let's see, moving on with that. I, I actually ha went right into a three day trip and, uh, this was kind of unique for me. I haven't, but I haven't had any, uh, any opportunities to go into Puerto Vallarta and spend the night. And so uh, that was, this week was my first opportunity to go down there and spend the night at one of the resorts. Oh, nice. And I got to tell you, that place is nice. It's, the, oh, uh, it's a, it's a Marriott resort there in Puerto Vallarta. And it is just top notch, top of the line. The property is just gorgeous. Yeah. Overlook the ocean. And, uh, so I really, uh, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I thought about all the other guys in the system, you know, some guys could be in uh, Minneapolis <laughs> right. and Detroit. And here I am in Puerto Vallarta at a nice beach resort and, uh, just sitting on the balcony watching the waves crash and, uh, you know, s having a cup of coffee and, uh, eating breakfast. So that was a really nice treat. Were you able to get there early enough to get a nice, uh, adult beverage? No, we got in really late, uh, and we had a long day too. The uh, day before, I think we did a uh, Salt Lake City turn, and then we ended up in Puerto Vallarta. So at the end of the day, I mean, we were pushing eight hours of flying with a uh, close to easily a uh, at least a twelve, thirteen hour duty day. So um, yeah, we were, I was eager just to get to the hotel and get some rest because I really wanted to enjoy. Uh, the property the next morning and we didn't have much time the next morning we had to leave at like i think it was like 12 o'clock so oh. made sure i got got right to bed and then got up early i think i was out of bed by like 7 30 out the door went down got some coffee and walked the beach and uh just enjoy the uh the weather and the scenery it was just it was gorgeous yeah how'd so, you like the I, rooms with the nice wood shutters and like real classic <laughs> south of the border yeah, style be honest with you i didn't want to come home <laughs> I, I, I took a picture, sent it to my wife and, uh, sent, sent her a text message. And I told her, I said, Hey, I, I think I found my permanent home. <laughs> oh, I don't think I'm coming home. And uh, yeah, <laughs> all uh, serious aside, you, <laughs> you probably told you her that and she was like, that. what? <laughs> you're right. you gotta be out of your mind yep yeah no. here i am at home with the kids slaving and you're over there and freaking on the beach yep. laundry yeah and there's Garbage a lesson to be learned up. there too as well is uh you know yes. you, you always want to you want to kind of downplay how wonderful some of these overnight destinations are i mean at the same time yeah. i mean last time we were talking you were telling me how you were in a Minneapolis, what was it, 10 degrees outside? So it all balances uh, seven. out. I think. It oh, was seven. seven. Yes, yeah, <laughs> correction, seven degrees. It all balances right. out, I think, in the end, for sure. It does, it does. Yeah. So let's see. So that was um, that was last week's trip. It was a three-day trip. Then I had one day off, mm -hmm. and I went right into another three-day trip. And this three-day tr trip was particularly awesome, too. Uh, I got to spend the night in Cabo San Lucas ah. at an all-inclusive resort. And uh, wow, again, <laughs> top-notch, free food, free spirits. Um, man, I, you know, I'm, here I am again on the beach thinking, hey, you know, this, I'm doing this for, for work. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> This sure be thrush hour traffic and um, deadlines and <laughs> all the things that come with uh, a lot of other uh, people's jobs. And so this, that was, it was just awesome. It's a tough Have you ever been to that one? You know? And Cabo, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it is a good a tough one. gig, and it, somebody's got to do it. Right. <laughs> well, as long as you do it with style, right? That's right. That's right. So, so you've been and pretty the, busy. You've been flying quite a bit. Have been. Yep. I have been. Yeah, I've, I've tried to um, front load and uh, back load my schedule. I do have vacation this month, so which actually start started about four or five hours ago. Um, yep. But I tried to front load and back load some of my schedule so that I can free up some extra time after my vacation. I have two daughters that play uh, club volleyball, and uh, March in particular is a very busy travel mm -hmm. month for uh, club volleyball. So uh, no rest for the weary. Tomorrow, wake up early, hop on an airplane. We're, fi we're flying out to Denver. Oh, wow. Uh, my oldest daughter has a tournament in Denver for uh, the weekend. So uh, I'll Any be particular uh, at the Denver Convention Center. Uh, earplugs. <laughs> earplugs <laughs> <laughs> the uh the event is held at the uh, denver convention center yeah uh, it's called the colorado crossroads uh colorado crossroads and uh it's a huge event it's actually a two-week long event and uh, yeah. they, they kind of split up the age groups but it's all girls uh under the age of 18 and there's over 130 volleyball courts crammed into the denver convention center so wow. Uh, I, I kind of, kind of try to do the math and I'm not good with public math, but there's literally over three or 4,000 people at any one time in that convention center for the, uh, volleyball games. Mm -hmm. And, uh, about a half of them are playing volleyball at the same time. So it's just, just loud whistles all oh, day yeah. long going off left and screams and cheering. And so earplugs. Earplugs. <laughs> Got to yeah. bring lots of totally earplugs. Get it. <laughs> totally get it. Well, yep. the reason I ask is uh, part of the show today, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, what's going on in the news. And Squawk Ident podcast is not just about the journey of aviators out there trying to navigate the career progression. It is also about the events that are happening that affect our journey as well and shape our decisions. So, you know, many of us have been watching the news. You can't get away from it unless you're in a cave somewhere or live in a van down by the river. Uh, it's just, it's <laughs> everywhere. And so the events that are now on everybody's uh, mind are this disastrous news that is being reported right now that many of us are paying attention to. And we're starting to wonder if this is it. Is this the big contagion event that you know we kind of see in the movies is this a uh, vaccine that they're working on that they're you know every other day you're talking about how long before this vaccine is ready to be distributed and when it's going to be complete and how many trials are going on is this supposed vaccine going to turn us all in a daylight avoiding zombies because the clinical trials were rushed all to make a profit for the pharmaceutical companies does Will Smith inevitably save the day as he did on the 2007 film I Am Legend? <laughs> and if so, uh, you know, how much of it is speculative? You know, we wanted to just talk a little bit today about an aviator's perspective to what's happening and throw in a few movie plots for good measure. So let's start out with the latest in the news that we haven't really heard much about. It's been put to the wayside. And we're just gonna spend uh, just real briefly on the 737 MAX. So Rob, as, uh, as a 737 driver yourself, I'm sure you have been reading you know, all the company email blast about you know when we can expect the max to get back online uh you know, legacy airlines does have a few of those maxes and they're currently parked right now but the 737 max will it ever come back to service will it be rebranded as a lot of industry insiders are you know speculating which is gonna have to happen this is a story that has taken a backseat to the effects that COVID-19 has played on the aviation industry, and we will dive more into that in a moment. But first, let's take a brief look at what the future of the 737 Maximus Rebrandicus could be. So Max 737 Fallout, it looks like um, that this 
737 issue is very, very complicated. I mean, there's so many stories about what happened, how the FAA kind of looked the other way to help Boeing self-certify. Uh, but I read an article recently, Rob, and I and I think I sent that to you earlier from AOPA magazine. Uh, now, AOPA, mm-hmm. the Airline Owners and Pilots Association, is an organization I've been involved with since my student pilot days. Uh, they're a great resource for general aviation pilots, as well as a charter 135 and 121 carrier pilots as well. Um, and in an article that came out just this month in the March edition, uh, entitled, Here We Are Facing March, the time when Boeing said in the fall that its controversial 737 MAX would re-enter service. Think it'll happen? Well, we already know it's not going to happen. Do you remember what the latest projections at Legacy were? Yeah, I think the latest projections were we canceled our um, operations through October, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we canceled our service through October. Um, and um, and I heard other carriers even push theirs through December, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, um, like Southwest Air- Airlines. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it doesn't look like anytime soon since we're only in March. Yeah. <laughs> that that plane is going to be certified right. to uh, fly again. The airplane has drawn plenty of criticism. Uh, according to this article, and I'll just read a little bit of it to you, written by Tom Horn of AOPA, uh, and he states that the airplane has drawn plenty of criticism since the two 737 MAX crashes that killed 346 passengers and an investigation that revealed that its stall protection system had fatal flaws. Some airlines canceled orders of the MAX, but Boeing kept making them, only to languish undelivered. In December, the FAA proposed a fine of $3.4 million on Boeing for faulty parts. Apparently, many of the 737NG and the 737 MAXs had been fitted with slack tracks that had been weakened by the presence of extra hydrogen during the manufacturing process. It goes on like this, right up to the failure of Boeing's Starliner space capsule to dock within the International Space Station. It seems that the Starliner's timer was set 11 hours in error. All this and more from the United States flagship aircraft manufacturer. What happened? Some industry insiders traced the trouble back to the 1996 merger of Boeing with McDonnell Douglas. Up to that time, Boeing prioritized its engineer expertise, but McDonnell Douglas was also known for its focus on the bottom line. This may have influenced the 737's MAX's design compromises. And the article goes on to explain how CEO Dennis Mullenberg took the heat for the MAX fiasco. He was fired, but in the traditional corporate America style, he received a golden parachute. What's a golden parachute? How about $62 million in equity and pension benefits and an additional $18 million in stock options? Now it's up to the new company president to pick up the pieces and move the company forward, which that could mean the cancellation of the entire MAX program. Now, the company, Boeing that is, is not the only company that's taken the heat here. There are plenty of other third-party companies that have had some devastating losses because of the MAX. Spirit Aerosystems is one. They're a major parts supplier for the Boeing 737 MAX, and they had to lay off 2,800 employees when the MAX production was temporarily halted in January of 2020. Now, we all know that the Boeing has had problems, and we've kind of looked as aviators to see what the heck's going on. And everybody talks about this MCAS system and, you know, how it failed and how the pilots didn't even know about it and stuff like that. But yep. did we ever really ask the question, why was that MCAS system installed in the first place? And the uh, author here, uh, Tom Horn, he did explain in a nutshell why this is a big issue and why the MCAS system was added inevitably to the 737 MAX. We all know that engines and technology are getting more fuel efficient and bigger. Well, the engines have become so fuel efficient in recent years 
partially because of the development of that bigger fan blade in that front section, right? And that bigger fan blade yep. now creates a larger cowling and a larger engine. Well, when you have a 737 that has kind of stubby landing gear, kind of low to the ground, those engines don't fit under the wing. So in all of their wisdom, Boeing decided that they would put those engines on on pylons that extended ahead of the wing. Well, of course, during flight testing, they discovered that when the aircraft was in a clean configuration with the autopilot off, meaning flaps up, autopilot off, and near stall angle of attack, the airplane would tend to pitch up even further, thus aggravating the stall condition. So MCAS was added, and its job was to automatically make nose-down commands to counteract this nose-up tendency in a stall. Boeing didn't even mention the MCAS system in its flight manuals, and the pilots didn't even know about it. And because Boeing believed that the MCAS replicated the stall behavior of other 737-type variants, that they didn't really need to know about it because, well, it was going to treat the aircraft just like a regular or other type 737. But, of course, the MCAS, we discovered could have a runaway situation, which would cause the airplane to pitch down and enter a high-speed dive where pitch forces were too high for humans to counteract them. That is what caused the MCAS issue in a grossly abbreviated nutshell. So instead of repairing and bringing the 737 MAX back out onto the industry, why not rebrand that? since it has such a bad, you know, reputation. And yeah. there are plenty of people out there that think that this airplane should be rebranded, including the president who tweeted information about that, which I'll let you uh, Google search and read on your own. He said that they really should add some bonus features and rebrand it and, you know, make it uh, something that people will look forward to being on. Well, there are plenty of people that think that most passengers don't even understand what airplane they're on. They have no idea. Why do they need to rebrand yeah. it? And the, the plane won't fly until it's safe. And, you know, especially CEOs are, are saying, hey, the planes are going to be safe. Why should we have to rebrand it? But just changing it to, a, like, say, 737-8 or 737-10 and removing the word max, it could be economically a good move. What do you think, Good Rob? Move, for sure. No, I I totally agree. Uh, anytime you mention the word "max" and in, in the uh, aviation uh, sense, uh, people automatically think about uh, the two crashes that they had last year. So I think rebranding the plane is uh, probably a smart idea. Uh, calling it the Dash Eight or the Dash Ten, uh, it certainly does take the reference off of the max history um but again like you mentioned you know this plane when when and if it does get certified which i i believe it will uh i think it's going to be one of the safest airplanes in the sky uh due to the fact that it has gone through so much scrutiny uh with the faa and the engineers that uh when this plane gets its sign off it is just going to be no doubtedly the safest designed airplane Boeing has ever, ever put out. Yeah. Uh, it's just no question. Yeah. yeah. And I believe the training so, is going to be intensive. I understand that along with the software updates and some of the other fixes, I mean, the latest article I read recently indicated that some of those uh, 737s that were coming off the manufacturing line, they found FOD in the fuel tanks. When they scoped the fuel they tanks, they found FOD. And I mean, that's a, a huge, I mean, any private pilot can tell you that contaminated fuel is the number yeah. one thing that you really want to try to prevent. I mean, that's why we have the fuel testing sticks. That's why we do bucket tests. Um, yep. you know, we have all this certification that the aircraft fuel system has been certified and clean and working properly because you can't just pull over on the side of the road and say, oh, the carburetor is <laughs> clogged. I got to get, you know, it's, this is a, a major deal. So yeah, Boeing has sure a is. lot to work on. I think part of the, I was going to say part of the uh, problem they have with, with all this that's going on is 
Um, every time they look into a system or something, they, they uncover something minor that kind of went overlooked uh, during the design phase. Mm -hmm. And um, now they've been uh, researching the, you know, the back office memos that have been going back and forth between the engineers pertaining to that new particular problem to see if that had any, uh, you know, cl uh, clashing ideas or clashing, um, you know, basically looking to see if there's any in internal turmoil pertaining to that particular problem and see w where and why and how they came to a resolution on that stuff. Because that's basically the, the whole gist of what, you know, the MCAS problem came with, which was design and design flaw. Yeah. You know, one system, no redundancy, yeah, and, and then a procedure that you almost can't follow uh, when you're low to the ground and at a high airspeed. Yeah. So yeah, we, we had a chance to re reproduce uh, a very similar situation in the NG in training mm -hmm. uh, during my last training event. And it was uh, pretty eye opening. Um, luckily, uh, due to all of the, um, uh, you know, all of the, the, you know, highlightened awareness of the MCAS going in the training, I made sure I was ready for a runaway stabilizer event. Oh, and did you get it? <laughs> and of course I got it. Excellent. I got it right after takeoff, right at about, uh, it was about 2,500 feet off departure. Um, the plane started to nose down and the and I was flying the airplane manually, meaning there was no autopilot engaged. Uh -huh. And the trim just started to sporadically run nose down. Uh -huh. And in the uh, 737, if you're not familiar, right on the center pedestal, there are these two wheels, one by one by uh, my left knee, if you're sitting in the first officer's seat, and one by the captain's seat, uh, his right knee. And I, I kind of think of it as like a, a table saw because it sticks up and it turns <laughs> like a table saw does, you know. Yeah. So anyway, and you don't want to touch it either because it'll, it'll it'll burn your pants. It'll kind of it'll it'll burn your <laughs> pants. It'll it'll you know hurt, bang up your hand. But um, but anyway, as I was saying, we were, were taken off and that thing started and it normally moves by itself. We have a system in, installed in your plane and it's auto trim. It trims the airplane. Um, for uh, when, when you're accelerating and decelerating for speed, it's kind of like a it's an auto trim system. And then we do have manual trim switches on on our control on our control yokes, mm -hmm. um, control wheels. Uh, but anyway, that thing was starting to run away like a you know like <laughs> like somebody stole something from a grocery store. So <laughs> so I went ahead and 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 you know reversed the trim reversed the command on the trim of the trim by the uh, the, the pitch trim on the uh, control wheel, uh -huh. which momentarily stopped it, but then it kept trying to run again away as I let yeah. go of it. Uh -huh. So the plane's nose started to get heavier, heavier, and heavier. Yeah. And, you know, so immediately I was like, hey, we got a runaway stabilizer. Let's run the runaway stabilizer checklist. And so in the meantime, I'm holding the trim in the opposite direction and I'm just trying to you know, hold the plane's nose up and maintain the cl at least a climb attitude that uh, that we were uh, in so that, you know, I wouldn't start a descent. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I was able to take care of it right away. Um, and so it wouldn't get, you know, progress into a further uh, nose down event. But um, we were able to run the procedure and um, and disconnect and inhibit the uh, the trim system so that uh, it wouldn't you know inadvertently run those down and cause the same situation as the max crashes did yeah. so and then in that case there now you know all we have is manual trim so that same big wheel that runs automatically has a little handle that pops out on the side and like you would on any uh, general aviation you know like 172 or piper or anything like that, you could just crank it with your hand, mm -hmm. just move it backwards and forwards with your hand. And it takes quite a bit of move, quite a bit of revolutions to make a difference. So um, for that, from the moment that I manually started trimming the airplane, it probably took me a good minute, maybe 45 seconds of constant turning to get the trim where I needed it, where I can almost fly it hands off. Yeah. So that was... That was kind of like the first lesson right there was to uh, 
you know, understand that, hey, if you ever have to use that, that thing, you're going to be cranking away at that thing <laughs> for a while to get it to where you really need it. And when uh, when the instructor saw that we had everything under control, he paused the sim and then he advanced our airspeed uh, up to about 280 knots in the same situation. Oh, and then he said, okay, when I, when I release the sim, I want you to now try to uh, run the trim wheel manually with your hand. And there was so much aerodynamic load on the horizontal stabilizer that you could not move that trim wheel. Oh, wow. I mean, it was, it was almost impossible. I mean, I, I was, I was trying to hold the nose up first of all, with every ounce of energy that I have. And you've seen me, Tony, I'm really strong. You know I mean? I could lift what, 20, 30 pounds. At so, least. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was, uh, it took everything that I had in me to uh, keep that wow. nose, uh, up pointed in the air. And then that we, we, we would, we were, we would have basically crashed the sim at that point, and which was brings us to where the max crash was. That's pretty much the scenario that they were in. Mm -hmm. They're at a super high airspeed. Nose trim was all the way down, and they needed to bring it up. But there's just so much aerodynamic load on the on the stabilizer that they, number one, almost couldn't move it. And right. if they could, they couldn't move it fast enough to get it to where they needed it to be. Yeah. So, yeah, and yeah if, if you remember. Uh... Back on your time on the Embraer 145, they had a limitation also upon departure when you took off before, what was it, a, I can't remember now, 155 knots or something like that? You right. had to retrim had to. the aircraft yep. because after that speed, uh, you're basically the a test pilot on. because the load on the, the aerodynamic load on the trim tab for that aircraft would be right. beyond the limits of the electronic uh, motor that controlled That's right. It. Yeah. Yep. So I the faster that. you go, the harder also, for for you to trim, as is any you know aerodynamic uh, law from flying, like you said, a Cessna 152 yep. all the way up to you know a commercial yep. airliner. And I really like the design of the Embraer to the uh, trim system because it also had that cutout. You know, every th uh -huh. was it three seconds, it would cut out. Yeah. So if the trim would move on its own for more than three seconds, it would automatically cut out which is genius, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and it would revert to the, uh, the manual. Manual, Well, mode, yep. you know, all this fallout from the Boeing Aircraft Manufacturing Company has had a relatively negative impact on the industry felt among many carriers around the globe. And to add insult to economic injury, not just Boeing and its airline customers are feeling that impact. Now, the effects of the COVID-19 outbreak are starting to have economic implications that are just now making an impact in the airline industry. From airline CFOs donning their golden parachutes to major cancellations of scheduled flights and astronomical expenses with sanitation and containment costs projected to skyrocket, this could be the next big industry crippler. So let's highlight what we know going forward as of March of 2020. So I've been bombarded lately. My inbox has had, you know, articles after articles that I subscribe to about what's going on in aviation. And most of it is predominantly about this coronavirus and how it's impacting airline operators around the world. The International Air Transport Association, the IATA, announced that the COVID outbreak is expected to result in a 13% full-year loss of passenger demand for airline operators in the Asia-Pacific region. A loss is expected to cause revenue uh, depreciation or revenue loss of $27.8 billion in 2020 for the carriers. The majority of the impact is projected to be on those carriers registered in China who are expected to lose $12.8 in the domestic market. Um, and this information is coming from an article I read uh, from airporttechnology.com, and it highlights uh, about what most of the countries are currently doing in terms of screening and uh, you know, airport measures and airline roles in 
this whole screening and sanitizing. Uh, and it's a great article. It's entitled The Coronavirus Outbreak, Safety Measures at Major International Airports, and written by Praveen Dudu. That's D-U-D-D-U. Following these preventative measures, some of the major and busiest international airports are trying to prevent the spread of the coronavirus uh, after its outbreak from Wuhan, China, and many others initiated similar steps. Now, the virus is currently spread to 77 countries, including the United States, and the borders and health emergencies have been declared by a number of those countries. So, is this really as bad as it seems? I mean, are we really looking at a contagion event? Well, according to the experts, potentially, yes. The U.S. Department of State has issued a level four travel advisory to China, meaning that the public is not advised to travel there. As a matter of fact, Legacy Airlines has been keeping its pilot group and employee group uh, appraised of the situation, and they have now canceled all flights in and out of not just the Wuhan province, but all of China for the foreseeable future. And then just today, uh, Vice President Pence was on the television giving information about the virus, about the CDC's involvement, and it looks like all travel coming in and out of China is now completely stopped. This is a big deal. and. What does this mean to the public? Well, it means most areas and most citizens, well, they weren't going to travel to China. So how does it really affect them? Well, all you got to do is turn on any of these news affiliates and it's the apocalypse. What do you think, Rob? Is this really as scary as we should uh, believe it to be? Well, I don't, I don't want to panic yet. <laughs> but. Uh... It's not getting any better. You know, that's that's a that's a fact, according to these uh, articles and the news reports. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think we're uh, I don't think I think they're trying to develop some kind of a. Vaccine. Mm-hmm. Have they come out with that yet? You know, if well, they're so, working on the uh, they're working on a vaccine. However, uh, according to the news conference today. Although they have started clinical trials, the clinical trials will take months to develop and get the data from. And after that, it might take more than a year before a vaccine is available for the public. Now, the president has said that, you know, get, wait till it warms up in April. And traditionally, the flu virus has been, uh, you know, diminished significantly with the warming temperatures and whatnot. And this is kind of a false hope to, you know, the, the citizens of not just America, but of the world, because this virus is not like the flu virus. This has a much higher contagion level. And according to a lot of the experts and the World Health Organization, this is a virus that we will be dealing with for the foreseeable future, possibly for years to come. You know, we've talked about this a little bit uh, in previous shows. You know, we talked about it during episode 24, where I had a, a good friend and a pharmacist come on and give us all kinds of information about how to prevent getting not this particular virus, but how to prevent getting the typical virus, the typical flu. And really the key is, and all the experts, including the CDC and the World Health Organization, agree as of right now in the United States, our best defense is exercising good hygiene and washing your hands for a minimum of 20 seconds, or according to Kelly, two happy birthdays. Happy birthdays. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> do you find yourself doing that in, uh, whenever you have the opportunity? I do. Only in full <laughs> uniform and in public. Yes, yes. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> exactly. And the, and the little kids start singing along. Next thing you know, you got a freaking musical in the bathroom of the uh, JFK International Airport. What can I tell you? So, I mean, really, yeah. this this virus is causing quite a ruckus. But sure what is. I'm concerned about, and I know you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past, and a lot of the 
the other aviators that we we've kind of deal with on a daily basis kind of agree is this a big economic corkscrew i mean is this really going to cause major economic downturn for the airline industry globally the answer is yet to be determined but you know we are starting to see some major carriers slash capacity. As a matter of fact, uh, according to flightglobal.com, the coronavirus outbreak has led Delta Airlines to slash capacity to Japan and delay a plan to launch flights to Seoul and Manila. So the Atlanta-based carrier says it will not operate a previously planned summer season flight between Seattle and Osaka and reduce weekly flights to other Japanese cities. This is just one small key in this entire reduction of flying, in not just the U.S., but throughout the world. Is this going to be a huge economic uh, you know, hammer to the system? Yeah. I. It, like you said, it's hard to tell right now what's going to happen, but it's obviously hitting the bottom end of our of the aviation, at least the majors that we know of. Um, they're hitting their bottom end because they're not able to operate into those regions. And um, uh, along those lines, I do know that uh, one of our competitor airlines, I believe, I believe uh, United Airlines, uh, for their pilot group, is offering um uh, zero time lines for their i don't know but zero time lines or 50 hour lines for their pilot pilots oh potential part time lines yeah because they don't have the flying um to uh to match you know what they have in their schedule so instead of you know i guess i, I don't think it comes down to furlough yet but um instead of you know having a half the pilot group sit around <laughs> at home yeah. and uh, not get a line or not get paid on their, their offering. Hey, if you guys want to take a month off, go ahead. <laughs> and we've seen this so, before. Uh, and I know we, you and I saw yeah, this have. at the uh, Sandpiper regional. Um, we did. And it's a scary time. And that really was the beginning of some really hard economic times and, uh, and what they, later dubbed as a recession, yeah. uh, furloughs yeah. to follow and whatnot. And I really hope that that's not the case here and that we can bounce back. But, you know, when you go to Costco yeah. and you see that they're completely out of water and toilet paper, I mean... It's having an effect. This is, this is crazy, you know? And my wife said it that is. it was empty. It was 5 o'clock on a weekday, yeah. the prime time where people pick up the kids after school and go right to Costco and do their shopping. The lines are usually five, six people deep, minimum. And she said it was yeah. walk-up service. Wow. And I got to tell you, uh, and this this relates to everything that we're talking about now. And I, I already mentioned earlier that uh, I'm going to go to uh, Denver with my daughter for a volleyball tournament. Um, there was an email that was sent out to all of the um, national members of this volleyball organization that kind of organizes all these events mm -hmm. and they're keeping an eye on this stuff. They were uh, contemplating about uh, canceling an event or two um, to try to uh, prevent the spread of anything that's, that's going around. And um, you know, it's, if it, I, and I'm thinking to myself, if it's getting to that level, um, then, you know, it's, it's starting to get serious. Yeah. So, and it has a potential to be, and you and I, like you just said, you know, we, we've been through the, uh, the lost decade and, and, um, you know, uh, through time, through rough times at Sandpiper. And, uh, we now joined the ranks at legacy and a lot of our co coworkers at legacy that have been there a while have uh, been through their lost decade. And, uh, I got to tell you at stuff, uh, uh, things, news of, of stuff like coronaviruses and stuff like that. We, we, we tend to flinch a little bit, um, you know, at the, at the sound of this stuff, because you and I know that it doesn't take much to, um, you know, to unbalance the, or, or un unstate destabilize the, uh, you know, the, what we have now and send us into another yeah. lost decade. 
Yeah. You, know, you often so hear us say, hey, we're stuff. sitting pretty, the upgrades are coming, I'm only so many numbers away, barring some natural disaster, you're going to be golden. And I've yeah. heard this, you know, now for months. And unfortunately, I now feel like uh, th- this, I'm flinching at this. And now number one priority is also always the uh, the safety, the health and well-being of, you know, my Absolutely. fellow man and, and people and family and friends. And so that always comes first, Yeah. but you always got to think about kind of the bottom line. And, and am I going to be able to hold my position? Am I going to have a job? Is there a potential for furlough? I mean, we've heard these journeys of aviators throughout the Squawk Ident podcast for, you know, many shows talking about how they survived furloughs. As a matter of fact, Captain Ash just told me a few episodes ago that his biggest challenge in his entire career, which was riddled with wonderful experiences and many difficult ones as well, was the fact that his first furlough was such an unknown for him. Uh, It was a very difficult time to kind of get through. Uh, And I don't wish that upon anyone to have to go through that. And that's the scary part, at least from an aviation perspective, is what if this turns out to be much bigger than it is currently projected to be, which is already pretty bad. Uh, Yeah, it's already pretty bad. I mean, it doesn't take much to send us into that downward spiral. And we talk about, uh, you know, the Swiss cheese model and the threat and error management stuff, um, you know, not uh, trapping some of those things. Well, you know, we have a kind of a trifecta setting up here. Uh, You you have the max thing going on right now, Mm -hmm. and it's, you know, affecting a lot of companies and Southwest is particularly having a hard time with that because a lot of their growth was um predicated on the uh, on the uh uh you know them uh, getting all those new max airplanes right uh us you know obviously we have 24 airplanes and now you have the coronavirus coming in and we're we're canceling flights to uh, china and uh and and i don't think most people really understand that a really good part of our revenue uh, from our airline comes from those international flights. Right. Not only so, the international uh, flights, but our code share agreements as well. And code share. Yeah. Code share is huge, yeah. not just for us, but for for all kinds of airlines uh, internationally. Exactly. And uh, Tony, I was just going to say, and and just think about the all the uh, tangible um, uh, things that come from the international business. I mean, the reason why we're going to China is. Because it isn't because people are going on vacation to China. It, it, there's business that's being done, and there's people that need to come, go back and forth into China. Well, think about those businesses and industries that you know do that kind of travel and pay that kind of money to go back and forth from China. And now they're, you know, all their flights are canceled. Yeah. So how how are they going to do business? What are they going to do about it? You know. So whatever industry that they're in, it's affecting them too. So it's 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 in a business sense it's this this uh coronavirus is far reaching yeah Not absolutely just, yeah so now if i was a betting man i, I would put say. money down on uh, telecommunicating uh i would be buying stocks in skype and zoom and what other <laughs> apps out there for uh, phone conferences because i have a feeling that at least for a period of time there's going to be many employers out there that are just going to tell their employees if you can work from home Stay home. Um, Stay home. And, you know, yeah. I've, I've heard a little bit about this uh, throughout some of the, the articles and stories that I've heard in just the last 24 hours. Uh, and I encourage people to take that opportunity if they feel that they're in a high-risk situation. If they can stay home, by all means. Uh, I got off the phone this morning with a dear friend and a former guest from the Squawk Ident podcast, uh, Mr. Luca DeFort. He is, uh, as uh, the listeners know that listen to his episode, he is in northern Italy. And, you know, when this northern Italy outbreak started, uh, the first person I called was Luca. And I asked him, you know, what's going on? Are you guys okay? You know, he says the streets are empty. He said the, the public transportation that is most used in Italy uh, is the public bus system, and they are empty. There's nobody on them. Uh, they're, really? still, they're still running, but a very, very reduced schedule. And, you know, his kids 
He has three kids. None of them are in school. They're all home from school. He said the kids are loving it because they don't have to go to school, but you know, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, they're worried about yeah. food now. They're worried about the availability of medications and things because the mm-hmm. entire area is pretty much on a lockdown. And yeah. it, it's unfortunate. He actually had just landed uh, the day before in Amsterdam, and he was going in for his recurrent SIM training. Uh, they use a private party company to do the SIM training for his airline. And he was refused to go into the SIM simply because really? he was an Italian national. Uh, and the the company there in Amsterdam said, I'm sorry, we, we can't let you in the building uh, because, wow. you know, you, you're, not a, you're not local and we're, you know, preventing the spread of Corona and we don't, we don't know wow. you. And, you know, so his company yeah. uh, was now scrambling. I mean, he's, he's fine. He's safe. He, uh, he has no issues, yeah. uh, but because of the kind of beginning of, I hate to call it panic, but it's just a extreme caution that everyone is going through. Uh, yeah, that yeah. you know, he got turned away, and I yeah. I touched base with him uh, later on in the day, and he said uh, he was still in Amsterdam. The company was looking for another uh, simulator company to provide mm. him with his recurrent training because if he can't get his recurrent training completed, then yeah. he's already in qual. his he's already in his extra month, you know, or his. Oh wow! So because last month they got canceled uh, for weather. Uh, situation wow. and now this month here he is he needs to get qualled and he can't and so potentially yeah. this could be a grounding event yeah and, and it's maybe another topic for another uh, podcast but hopefully you know he has some protections and if he has a contract for that company that at least protect him pay wise <laughs> if he ever ever dequals because uh, yeah. that i mean that's almost totally out of his control Absolutely. You know, if, and and I got and you reminded me actually today when I was clearing customs, uh, the customs officer asked me specifically, "Have you been out of the country specifically to China?" Yeah. And I was like, uh, "No," <laughs> but you know, kind of caught me caught me off guard yeah. because uh, uh, yeah, I normally don't get that question. So uh, and I ooh, also read yeah, that, uh, an article indicating that they were starting to do thermal screenings for passengers coming in from Mexico. Did they did they check your temperature at all? You know, um, if they were, it wasn't anything that was noticeable. Um, you know, I don't know if they were using if they have some kind of setup already uh, just, uh, you know, built into the custom screening area that, that does that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, they have some really high tech stuff already in our customs area. I don't yeah. know if they have it in LA, but you know, now it's all facial recognition software. Yep. Uh, you don't even, you don't even use your passport. No, nope, that can um, stay so, in your you know, pocket. Cause you have a, a couple of reasons. You, one, you have the facial recognition software. All crew members yep. have been, uh, you know, FBI checked and whatnot. Yep. And your passport now has an RFID. Yeah, the chip in it. So yep. they know so, it's in your pocket because yeah. they have the scanners there in customs. And as you yeah. mentioned, they do have the thermal imaging cameras yep. in their baggage claim, yep. in their customs area. And I know yep. LA is LA is sharp. They Yeah. And there was a there was a uh, noticeable difference in the uh, presence of customs officers in the uh customs area in dallas yeah um and so it, it i did i did notice that today and uh you know so that's certainly uh something that is uh not standard and like you said there's a heightened awareness um and uh yeah it's going to be interesting to see uh where we go from here because mm-hmm. you know you know unfortunately uh you know we all know that you know, we'd like to get it better, but if it gets worse, you know, this, you know, not only people are going to get sick and die, but you know, that's, that's the worst case scenario, but you know, the, the business implications for aviation and all the businesses that rely on it, um, are going to suffer. So, 
We'll see. So earlier today, I read an article that came out on March 2nd uh, from the Washington Post entitled, Major Airlines, U.S. Officials Clash Over Passengers Tracking Related to the Coronavirus Cases. Now, we don't really think about that, but tracking, what does that mean? You know, where do we draw the line on privacy? Does the government get a pass? Does protecting us from a deadly and uber contagious virus trump, pardon the expression, the constitutional protections? I mean, these are the questions that we should be asking, not things like, can I get the virus from eating Chinese food? Which, yes, I did hear that on the, on the news that uh, uh, they had an expert doctor on their news channel. I won't mention the exact affiliate, but y- yeah, the, one of the hosts asked, well, can I get the virus from eating Chinese food? And the video has since been deleted and taken down. <laughs> but, you know, the question about privacy comes up. I mean, if it was me, I personally think that we do have to do everything we can to protect our rights as U.S. citizens and uphold the Constitution, because without that, you know, it really starts to become a slippery slope. However, when it comes to protecting the general public, I personally would be willing to say, hey, you want to screen me for a virus that could potentially kill me? Absolutely. freaking lutely You want to know my name, my number, my yeah. email, my, you know, everything. I'll tell you. That's fine. But, you know, yeah. it, also, where do you draw the line? Well, what if I don't want to tell you? What if I want to protect that right? So what's happening now is, uh, according to this article from the Washington Post, the U.S. officials are pressuring airline executives to turn over the email addresses and phone numbers of international passengers as the Trump administration tries to track who may have been exposed to the coronavirus. According to five people briefed on the situation, the government officials have said that they need the data so that they can warn local authorities who might have uh, been exposed to the virus. But the airline industry has balked, saying that the federal government should instead share information it already collects among different agencies and come up with a system for obtaining the rest. The impasse has dragged on for weeks despite concerns about the growing number of people with coronavirus in the United States. It has become a top issue of the Trump administration's virus task force and U.S. lawmakers. Airline executives are slated to meet with Vice President Pence on Wednesday, which they just finished meeting today. And they had a little bit of a press conference afterwards. Uh, Pence did boast how he did sit down with CEOs and executives from the airlines, and they have collectively come up with a plan to collect the data. Now, what the specifics are, I don't know, um, and I'll be looking forward to reading up on that here in the near future. So yeah. where do you draw the line? I mean, do you, do you give up some of these rights and say, well, here you go? I mean, Apple has yeah. been uh, very good at Encrypting data and not letting the government, no matter what they throw at them, give them our personal information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Facebook too. You know, Facebook's this. You know, Mark uh, Zuckerberg or whatever his name is <laughs> sat in that uh, inquiry this past year, and man, you know, that's that's a very, very, very touchy subject, slippery slope, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you want to protect protect the uh, the. the the people and everything like that. But then again, you don't want to fringe on their privacy. So where do you draw the line? What do you do? How do you handle this? I mean, that's, that's always a problem. Um, or it's always, a, I didn't say it's a problem. It's always a challenge um, in, in, in the United States because, you know, we value the rights that we have here. And one of them is right, you know, your privacy. So, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. That's you know, tough. you've heard I mean, the conspiracy also, theory, right? With Zuckerberg? Conspiracy theory. Yeah, how he was <laughs> approached by the CIA when he was a, a young 18-year-old uh, <laughs> in college. And, and they said, hey, we want you to come up with a way, uh, you know, because spying on people is too expensive. You know, wiretaps and subpoenas and, and you know, getting all these things. Right. It's, it's very expensive. We want you to find a way to have people tell us where they are, who they're with, what they're eating, <laughs> what they're wearing, what they look like, 
and I want them to just give us this information. Can you do it? And he said, Can you do it? Yeah, I think so. I'll call it Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> and of course, that's morphed Genius. into everything else, right? So, yeah. Yeah, sure is, man. That's yep. funny. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, the airlines, they tell you that your data is is private when you, you know, enter it on the computer. Mm-hmm. And we don't share this, in, this information with anything. And you, you always put your credit card number and all that other stuff on there. So it's private information, you know. So mm-hmm. um, and now they want to know where you're coming in from and where you've been in the last 30 days or so. Um, wow. Yeah. That's going to be interesting to see where that goes. Yeah. And Justin, uh, I was text messaged uh, in the middle of this podcast. Uh, my wife just sent me a message, a news article from NBC4, indicating that a Los Angeles coronavirus screener is among those infected with the virus in Southern California. This coming from NBC4 of Los Angeles. It turns out that one of at least six people in Los Angeles who have tested positive for COVID-19 worked last month as a medical screener at LAX checking the overseas travelers for symptoms of the virus, according to the Department of Homeland Security. The screener, described as a medical professional, was a contract employee who tested positive Tuesday after showing symptoms on February 29th, the DHS said in a statement to NBC News. You know, this is scary because it is. up to this point, I know I kind of had the the idea that, well, you know, yeah, we're we're amongst the passengers and stuff, but as pilots, you know, we're kind of protected in the cockpit and we're really not in the back of the cabin and you know, uh, right? We don't have people directly sneezing onto us or touching right. any of the equipment that we operate. And yeah. although we're international, I you know, I'm not going to Asia. I'm not doing those long haul right. flights. I'm not I'm not on that equipment. So I thought, right. well, you know, I think I'm okay, you know, and I wash my hands and I'm careful. Yeah. But I'll tell you one thing that I have stopped doing, and it's really difficult for me. Uh, when I first meet crew members, I always, always want to introduce myself, shake their hand, shake their ask hand. them how their day yeah. is going. Because, yeah. you know, we talk about uh, CRM, opening the lines of communication, not putting up barriers, you know, doing all the things we can for inclusion, uh, and I know you just came back from Recurrent where you had some of the uh, more sensitivity training that we were discussing in an earlier episode there, That's the right. unconscious biases and how to make sure that we're not bias. you know, cutting people out um, mm-hmm. of the conversation. And so now I've, you know, I'm really starting to appreciate the Japanese culture, and I think I'm just going to bow and bow say hello head. yep hello how you doing yep. you know, I'm, i give i give the little head bow you know um mm-hmm. nothing too crazy and i just tell them like hey man i'm just right now I'm, we're not shaking right now you know so i hope that's cool and and everyone seems to be pretty positive uh towards yeah. the change it's still difficult for me but you know i, I think that's the safe yeah. thing to do yeah, i think they say tough. 10 feet is the yeah because our yeah our social cult- culture is uh you know definitely revolves around greetings with shake handshakes. So it's really tough to, you know, not do it all of a sudden, you know, if you're uh, around your buddies and, you know, you haven't seen them in a while and, you know, you're running to them in the terminal, you know, that's the first thing you do is, Hey, you know, with a big handshake and now it's going <laughs> to, yeah. you're going to be throwing up the fist pump or the elbow bump. <laughs> the elbow bump. Yeah. I, I still think that 10 feet and a bow and, you know, <laughs> it's good enough. Good. As a matter of fact, I actually saw something on Facebook where these guys were doing like the foot, the foot shake, you know, they, one guy would put his foot out, the other guy would put his other foot out and they kind of, they you did know, the kid in play heels. Yeah. The kid in play. Thing. Are you that, there you go. Me? That's a good name for it. But, yeah. So every time they came up to somebody, they kind of did a little kid in play a little, little dance with the thing. And <laughs> all right, funny. I want you to practice because the next time I see you in the terminal in full uniform, we're going to do the kid and play. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> well, the general public's yeah. perception of reality is often swayed by the entertainment industry. And so many Americans depend on, you know, their lives coming from film and television. I mean, no, I'm not talking about news networks. I'm talking about movies and network shows and network series. I mean, we all binge watch and stay up late and watch our Netflix shows or our prime shows and Hulu and whatnot. And I noticed just the other day when I was scrolling through Netflix and Amazon Prime, they have a trend 
or trending menu. And a lot of those films I started to realize were films about contagious outbreaks of <laughs> viruses. And I thought, wow. seriously, this is, you know, we're having a very serious, very, you know, potentially disastrous, both uh, physically, health wise, economically. I mean, this is some pretty serious stuff. And I guess we have a tendency to escape and kind of downplay it by watching a cool film about, you know, the <laughs> contagion outbreak. So I kind of took a look at what's trending on Netflix and Prime. And these are just a few of the films that I saw on there that I think that are probably a good idea to watch with your kids. And then at the end of it, hey. you need to stand up and you need to point to them and you go, you see what happens? You it's see what the happens? So official public training of what happens when there's a virus. That's it. <laughs> and how to handle it. <laughs> exactly. So I took a look and here are some of the top ones. And, and stop me if you if you remember any of these films and, and give me your uh, your two cents on them too. So there's a 1995 film called Outbreak starring Dustin Hoffman, Rene Russo, Morgan Freeman, Cuba Gooding Jr., Patrick Dempsey, Donald Sutherland, and Kevin Spacey. Now, this film, I remember watching it, and I haven't seen it in a couple of years. Maybe I should sit down you know, with the girls and, and watch it again. But it is a movie directed by Wolfgang Peterson, and it's based on Richard Peterson's nonfiction book, The Hot Zone. And what does it talk about? An Ebola-like virus, the Motaba, in Zaire, and later in a small town in the United States, uh, it starts to become a problem. Disease control or CDC and prevention come into this fictional town of Cedar Creek, California, and the outbreak's plot speculates how far the military and civilian agencies might go to contain the spread of a deadly and contagious disease. The film was released on March 10th, 1995, and it was a box office success, and Spacey won two awards for his performance. A real-life outbreak of Ebola virus was occurring in Zaire when the film was released. Go figure. Wow. I didn't so, know that. Wow. It's a great yeah. film. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think it's well worth a watch. Yeah, I remember watching this. This Out of all the movies that you do have listed here, that's probably the most memorable one for me because I think that was the first one that I saw, and you know you kind of always remember your first. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I, I I do need to watch it again, and I haven't seen it in probably, gosh, at least ten, fifteen years. Yeah. But um, it was a good one. It was a really good one, and I I remember uh, some of the scenes, and uh, seeing you know the people when they're sick. <laughs> Mm-hmm. in their in their physical state and thinking oh my gosh yeah. that's got to be horrible <laughs> Re- really good uh special effects and makeup on this film absolutely yeah <laughs> another trending film uh is a 2013 film called world war z starring brad pitt marielle enos and james badge dale now world war z is more of a zombie apocalyptic film uh than kind of a contagion film uh, but I remember watching it. it. It was actually pretty interesting. The special effects in it are quite staggering. Now, this is a 2013 American apocalyptic action zombie horror film directed by Mark Foster. That's a mouthful. The film star, Brad Pitt, as Gary Lane, a former U.S. or United Nations investigator who must travel the world to find a way to stop a zombie pandemic. So, great zombie film, uh, really. Uh, and it talks about how the zombies, you know, they spread and multiply and they're coming after the healthy and the living. And, you know, always a good contagion zombie style movie to get your blood flowing and, and sell popcorn and movie tickets. Uh, an- another uh, another one of these uh, movies that are trending on Netflix and Amazon Prime is probably by far my favorite Contagion film that I've ever seen. The 2011 film titled Contagion, starring Marion Cotillard, Matt Damon, Lawrence Fishburne, Jude Law, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Kate Winslet. This film... I watched with my daughter not too long ago when all of this 
uh, you know, coronavirus news started happening. And the reason I watched it, you know, yes, it's an entertainment film and it's, that's really all you can take from it. But I really wanted her to kind of see how bad this kind of, uh, contagious virus can be and how important it is to wash your hands, to keep your distance, to exercise good hygiene. And as the movie unravels, uh, you can see how the public kind of falls apart and society falls apart. And some of the, the scenes, especially Gwyneth Paltrow's, uh, you know, acting in this is, <laughs> it's quite riveting. Uh, she wow. gets. She's a businesswoman that goes to China and gets infected when she eats um, some food, some exotic food. And in at the end of the film, I won't give it away, but the last few minutes, it goes through a montage and it shows how the virus spread from patient zero. Wow! And so you wow. watch the whole film and you don't really ever really understand how it spread and how it got started. All you see are the repercussions of this spread. But at the end of the film, they give you the kind of complete plot line and how it originated. And yeah. wow. talk, about, talk about the importance of washing your hands. <laughs> it could have all been and, avoided you know, if one person would have washed their avoided. damn hands. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You just reminded me uh, earlier in, uh, in, in the introduction of the... Uh, of the topic, uh, you talked about the reporter acts asking if you can get the virus by eating Chinese food, and what you just said that uh, Gwyneth oh, Paltrow's character did. She was in China and she ate Chinese food, so perhaps maybe that's where they got the idea to ask the question. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because my friend Luca had sent me uh, a post that has been circulating around the socials. And when I saw it, I really kind of, I had to like take a double take. Now, everyone that reads regularly novels knows who Dean Koontz is. Dean Koontz ha writes these wonderful uh, works of fiction, a lot of suspense, a lot of murder mystery style uh, novels. And he wrote a book back in the, God, I think it was like the late 80s, maybe the early 90s. And one of his novels is called The Eyes of Darkness. In the Eyes of Darkness, he talks about something very interesting. And I'll just read a little bit of the passage that my friend Luca sent me. Lee Chen defected to the United States carrying a diskette record. Now, a diskette, for those of you who are maybe a little too young to understand, uh, before we had USB sticks that you can put gigs and gigs and gigs of data <laughs> or terabytes of data on relatively quickly. Uh, before that, we had, of course, CD-ROMs. And before CD-ROMs, we had these plastic, what were they, 4.5 4 inch or 5.4 inch diskettes? Yeah. And you had to put Diskette, the yep. diskette, yeah, what, 524 megabytes the, or something like that? or The floppy disk, yep. The floppy disk, okay. <laughs> so, But I digress. So a diskette <laughs> record of China's most important and dangerous new biological weapons in a decade. They call the stuff Wuhan 400 because it was developed at their RDNA labs outside of the city of Wuhan. And it was the 400th viable strain of the man-made microorganism created at that research center. Wuhan 400 is a perfect weapon. It affects only human beings. No other living creature can carry it. And like syphilis, Wuhan 400 can't survive outside of the human body for longer than a minute, which means it can't permanently contaminate objects or entire places the way anthrax and other virulent microorganisms can. Now, again, this is a passage from a fictional novel written by Dean Kuntz entitled The Eyes of Darkness. This novel was written over 20 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. Now, coincidence? Wow. Wow. Yes, absolutely. It is coincidence because uh, this uh, coronavirus <laughs> has been around for a long time, and this is just a, a new uh, iteration of the virus to hear the COVID-19, right. you know, more powerful, stronger uh, not so friendly virus, but yeah, interesting article. Right. <laughs> and if you've seen this on the socials, yeah, uh, that's where it's coming from. The last movie I just wanted to briefly Amazing. talk about is uh, again another one trending on Netflix is a 2015 film called Twelve Monkeys, starring Bruce Willis, Madeline Stowe, Brad Pitt, and Chris Plummer. Now, Twelve Monkeys is 
probably one of the first kind of dark contagion films I ever saw. Uh, it, uh, it really is kind of this neo-noir science fiction. It was directed by Terry Gillum, and it was inspired by Chris Maker's 1962 short film, Le Jeté. And starring Bruce Willis, this is a great film that talks about how viruses and you know contagious diseases can, can get out there. Uh, the film is about a deadly virus that in 1996 wipes out almost all of humanity, forcing survivors to live underground. A group known as the Army of the Twelve Monkeys is believed to have released the virus. In the year 2035, James Cole is a prisoner living in a subterranean compound beneath the ruins of Philadelphia. And the movie goes on. So, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I've given you a book to read and a couple movies. I'm adding that to my watch list right now. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, as mentioned in the previous episode, Squawk Ident, the number one source of COVID-19 data, uh, are the cdc.gov and the World Health Organization, or who.int, which now has a scam alert. I was on the WHO website earlier today, and they have a COVID-19 scam alert. How people are scamming others with this <laughs> virus as the topic is, <laughs> I mean, they need to go to a special prison for that kind of stuff, man. Uh, Today's press conference with Vice President uh, Mike Pence again reiterated that the threat to Americans remain low. However, minimizing close contact and washing your hands regularly is the best way to deter catching this COVID-19. So here you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We've talked about a little bit of the industry, the economics behind parking a new developing aircraft with the 737 Maximus Rebrandicus. Um, we've talked a little bit about the implications of uh, COVID-19 and how this economically could be a big factor in job opportunities for the future, uh, job uh, placement, For current aviators, could this be an economic downturn for the aviation industry and for the world? Uh, Well, that's yet to be seen. And I don't want to spark any kind of, you know, negative ideas and, and panic out there because we don't know. And we just have to continue to keep an eye on it and keep an educated foundation of knowledge. And we need to go right to the source. Don't go to the first news outlet. I'm doing air quotes, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go to the first news outlet and just believe everything that you hear and panic and go to Costco and buy all the freaking water on the shelf because the zombies are coming over the wall. You know, (laughs) just stay calm. The zombies are not out there. See. Oh, oh my God. What's that? (laughs) What is that? Uh, oh my God! Somebody's out is there. Is that a zombie? Somebody was out there. I don't know. <laughs> I was gonna say, in Texas, we don't run to Costco and drain all the water bottles off the shelf if the zombies are coming. We go and buy all the bullets and ammunition we can so that we can shoot them bastards. That's well, <laughs> yes, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen the videos. You know, but ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing is not to panic. That's right. <laughs> Crash positions, everybody. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think we'll be okay. Be careful yeah. out there, Rob. I know you've got that uh, the volleyball tournament coming up. You're going to be in close proximity with uh, a lot of people. Uh, do me a favor. Make sure you uh, put on your gas mask. Walk in there in your full hazmat <laughs> suit. Don't freak anybody out. Just go ahead and protect no. yourself and your family. I'm just saying. <laughs> and try to try to keep a 10-foot bubble around me from people crossing into my personal 10-foot bubble zone. <laughs> so tomorrow I deadhead to uh tomorrow I deadhead to Maui. First class. Nice. Because it's international. All right. Hey man. Yep. And I got a Styling. notification. There will be a check airman on your flight. I'm like, "Well, I'll be in first class, so I don't care." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have said that. I the I did get a, a check airman on my uh, Cabo overnight. 
Oh, and uh, we had a we had a great time, man. He's he's a super guy, and uh, we we just yeah. You mentioned it in a lot of other episodes, but how you know when when they value your your input and and pass and expertise, you know yeah. that you had from Eagle. You know it it makes it makes your you know time shared together so much better. And that, this guy was he was just just like that. He was like, oh man, you know you you know you have all that experience over there, and you know it's great over here, and it showed. And you should have seen it too, man. The the weather in Dallas today wasn't so nice. Oh really? We had a lot of thunderstorms, and actually yesterday was crazy, man. We had microbursts, uh, wind shear, planes going around in the Burton, and it wasn't even didn't even look that bad out there. But the really? um, da, uh, yeah, the airport's uh, wind shear system was going off, and uh, planes were rejecting takeoffs on the runway. We had a, I saw we actually physically watched a high speed abort. Um, on three six right in Dallas day yesterday, uh-huh. guy got cleared for takeoff, and about about a you know a third of the way down his takeoff roll, the uh, the tower goes uh, wind shear alert, runway three six right departure in, which is the runway that he was on, uh-huh. and you know oh American you know one two three four is rejecting takeoff on the runway, and you know so he he blows right past us and you know used the whole runway. I mean he didn't. He didn't look like he was using maximum effort braking. Yeah. But, you know, he used the whole runway, pulled off, and he's like, yeah, we're going to have to go back to the gate. We're probably going to have hot brakes. <laughs> so, but anyway, today, landing with the Czech Airman, man, it was one of those scenarios where, you know, we, we had a, a good a good 20-knot crosswind and a little bit of light turbulence coming down, the, down on the ILS. So, you know, hand fly hand flew it below a thousand feet yeah so i was i was kind of you know getting on the controls to keep the plane um you know on course on glide path and uh you know so i was working hard dude and the plane's just doing its shake rattle and roll all the way down and just as i got into the flare it was just the picture perfect to any approach man the wheels just squeaked onto the run i mean we didn't even i mean the the speed brakes didn't even deploy, meaning that they, the plane did, you know, it's kind of like, remember the Embraer, you yeah. get the landing gear, air ground fail. Yeah. Yeah. The plane didn't even know you're on the ground yet. <laughs> so, so that's you, what we got. You worked, it worked you out. You Bronco bowled it all the way down and it, and it rewarded you with the. <laughs> that's <laughs> it. It was perfect. Well, even the passengers are saying, wow, I didn't even know we were on the ground until I heard the thrust reversers coming out. And uh, the captain was like, man, that was amazing. I don't know how you did that. And I'm like, well, every, you know, got lucky. <laughs> yeah, even a blind squirrel gets a nut once in a while, right? That's it, man. That's it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I just would like to say thanks again to Rob D for joining me on this, the 30th episode of Squawk Ident. Are you enjoying Squawk Ident? I really do hope so. Please visit our website at www. Dot aviatortony.com that's alpha victor the number eight romeo tango oscar november yankee.com there you can check out all kinds of things like episode cover art episode archives the pilot shop and you can leave audio feedback as well you can also contribute to the show and help us out with equipment and software and marketing expenses by becoming a producer of squawk ident either with a one-time donation or a monthly contribution And now check out the flight line photo tab. There I post as many photos from the flight line as I can muster. And do you have any favorite images? We'd love to hear about it. You can contact us through the socials on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Just search Squawk Ident Podcast or Aviator Tony and Squawk Ident to follow. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we sure would appreciate a good review, a like, and a share. Also, this episode of Squawk I Did was recorded on a new toy. Yes, I now am a proud owner of the Rode Podcast Mic. If you like what you hear and can tell the difference in the sound, drop me a DM and let me know. In closing, I'd like to just say thank you for taking the time to listen to this grateful aviator. Keep the dirty side down, be safe, and take care of each other. And wash your damn hands! (laughs) 